Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about the latest developments in the prosecution and persecution of Julian Assange. Our guest, Greg Barnes, senior counsel, is an Australian barrister speaking to us from Australia. He is a former president of the Australian Lawyers Alliance. He was appointed senior counsel in Tasmania in 2020. He is chair of the Prisoners Legal Service in in Tasmania and is a patron of the Justice Reform Initiative. Greg Barnes, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks, David. I I should also declare that I'm an advisor to the Australian Assange campaign. Very good. Glad that you are. Um, So uh, who is coming to the United States and what for? Well, there's a small group of Australian MPs, uh, both from the House of Representatives and the Senate, coming to Washington between uh, roughly between the 20th and 22nd of September. Um, It's a cross-party delegation, so it includes people from the left and from the right in Australia. Um, Going to Washington to meet with congressmen, uh, congresswomen, um, and uh, other officials, uh, certainly including in the uh, Biden administration, to discuss uh, freeing Julian Assange, essentially, that the US should stop its continued um, attempt to prosecute Assange and allow him to be reunited with his family. And do these members of parliament represent a consensus view? Uh, What are the views within the the Australian government now? Well, uh, just to take that that first point, um, there was a letter that's been signed now by well over 60 MPs. There are 237 MPs in the federal parliament in Australia. So uh, over 60 now getting up towards 70 have signed a letter uh, supporting Julian Assange uh, that was signed Uh, very recently. Um, There's also strong support on the behalf of the Albanese government. The Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, is very supportive of the US ending the case against Assange. And significantly, the Conservative opposition has now said it supports uh, the release of Julian Assange or the ending of the US legal proceedings against Julian Assange. So there is strong community support in Australia. There's very little opposition to this occurring. And will they be meeting with the U.S. Attorney General or the President or members of Congress, or will they be protesting out on the sidewalk like me? What what will they be up to? Well, um, the Australian Embassy has a, will have a, um, a a role in setting up some of those meetings. I think that the process is trying to meet with some of the relevant U.S. government departments, um, but making it very clear to both the Congress and to the Biden administration that this is. A united front and there is a strong view in Australia that this is now an alliance issue. In other words, you know, the US of course sees Australia as its number one ally in the Asia Pacific region and in fact globally. Um, and this is now an issue that's really harming the alliance between Australia and the United States. And that message is going to be very clearly put across by these MPs. Very good. And and this this majority opinion in Australia, in the in the public, apart from the government, do we know? Uh, if the Australian public wants this prosecution dropped? Yeah, look, the the polling that um, we've seen, and we commissioned some polling last year, which indicated, you know, around 8 in 10 Australians uh, want to see an end to these proceedings. I think Australians take the view that uh, whatever Julian Assange might or might not have done, um, you know, enough's enough. And I talk to people about this, particularly those who've been involved in uh, politics, over the years and have not been particularly sympathetic to Assange, they often say to me now, look, I'm not particularly sympathetic to Assange, but enough's enough. He's had four years in Belmarsh prison. Before that, of course, as we know, he was in the Ecuadorian embassy. I also think the view of a lot of Australians is um, why are they pursuing a person who uh, uh, has revealed uh, serious war crime activity on the part of the United States in both Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. That's the sort of information the world needs to know, and he shouldn't be punished for it. Uh, indeed, he should be thanked. A lot of people have been trying to figure out this talk of a of a plea deal. How do you plead guilty to sort of misdemeanor journalism instead of felony journalism uh, when it isn't a crime? But what I- is there a possibility of a plea deal, and what would it consist of? 
Well, that's a matter for the, the uh, Julian's lawyers in the US and also in the UK. But uh, what I can say, as his brother Gabriel Shipton has said, and in fact, Gabriel will be with these MPs in the United States, uh, what what he has said, of course, is that uh, you know Julian does not want to set foot in, in the United States, and for very obvious reasons, because there are people, as you know, who would like to see the end of Julian Assange in a literal sense, uh, and so uh, that that's an issue. It's also the issue that you've just raised, which is, of course, that he's done nothing wrong. Um, it's significant, as we know, that uh, those who published the same material in 2010, 2011, you know the New York Times, The Guardian, et cetera, they have not been prosecuted. Uh, so why are we prosecuting the you know, original publisher of this material? And it took them yeah, years yeah. to come around and support uh, the opposition to this prosecution, right? I mean, it was, not, it was in recent years or months that these major newspapers that so benefited from his work finally said they supported leaving him alone, right? Yeah, look, I mean, it, it, you know, there was a letter, I think, earlier this year or maybe late last year to the Biden administration from editors of the New York Times, The Guardian, Der Spiegel uh, and other newspapers which had published that material, making it very clear that they did not support uh, this prosecution. It's also the case that in Australia, uh, the media, um, well, the, the, the Journalists' Union, uh, Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance has also been very strong on this issue. And it's also... Uh, something that people uh, need to note, which is that in Australia, uh, WikiLeaks won what was called, and Julian Assange won what was called a Walkley Award. That is uh, an annual award which, which is given to journalists for uh, outstanding work. And that happened, I think, in 2011, 2012. So, you know, there's been strong support from the media within Australia. Before the four years in prison in England, where Julian Assange still is, uh, he spent, I think, seven years in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, during which time uh, he maintained and many of us maintained that it, this was uh, an effort to get him extradited to the United States. Uh, and that opinion was mocked and ridiculed and denounced and turned out to be correct, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, th there's no doubt that um, uh, Sweden had a track record of the time, and of course, just just to go back, of course, the Swedes wanted to speak with him about some allegations um, in Sweden. Um, uh, there was no doubt that at the time in 2012, 2013, Sweden had a poor record when it came to sending people back to the United States. Um, and Julian, quite rightly, as was his entitlement, as the entitlement of all of us, is you know sought asylum in Ecuador, um, the Ecuadorian embassy, and of course, the Ecuadorians gave him asylum. Uh, fairly quickly. Um, you know, the United States pursuit of Assange has been relentless. It's cost millions of dollars in court proceedings, and it continues. And, you know, where's the public interest in continuing to pursue this matter, particularly in the context of Chelsea Manning, um, having uh, her sentence commuted by uh, the Obama administration? And so what is it that Julian Assange is, is charged with? Because there has been this pretense all along that it's something other than journalism, that it's somehow different from what newspapers and radio shows and television shows do every day. What What is he accused of? Well, he's accused of, I mean, they're using the Espionage Act, which of course, as you know, is a piece of legislation designed from the First World War to do something very different than chase publishers and journalists. One of the disturbing aspects is that um, uh, he would face, uh, theoretically, uh, around 170 years in imprisonment. In other words, an effective death sentence if he were convicted or, uh, and sentenced in relation to these charges. But the other danger, of, and, and this is a danger for journalists in Australia and anywhere in the world, what the United States is doing is saying, we will use our domestic laws, the Espionage Act, to go after anybody who publishes material you know, which we are embarrassed about. Now, uh, that's called extraterritorial reach in Australia and the United States and others condemn um, China for uh, threatening to uh, seek the extradition of, of journalists and others, dissidents and others who fled overseas and make uh, comments about China or reveal information about China. We condemn it. We say how terrible it is. But here's the United States doing exactly the same thing. 
Aren't there a couple of particular problems with the Espionage Act? One being that the defendant doesn't get to make a real defense, so it's not a fair trial. If he could even get a fair trial in this country where the the, the top political officials have been denouncing him as a as a criminal and a and a killer. Uh, and second, uh, isn't he being accused of spying for some foreign nation without even having to name what the foreign nation is, which would mean that pretty much anybody could be accused of, of espionage without evidence. Yeah, look, I, I'm not an expert on US law, but certainly as I understand it, there are some serious problems with using the Espionage Act. And as I said a moment ago, this act, which I think is a 1917 act, so you know it's, it's over 100 years old, it is not designed uh, and, it, and you know, those who passed that law at the time would never have thought that you would use it to go after journalists, particularly to go after people who are not US citizens and who have not set in the foot in the United States for the purpose of obtaining that material and in publishing that material. Um, so uh, it's seriously problematic. It's also problematic, of course, because as you've rightly identified, um, you know, getting a fair trial in Eastern Virginia would be you know, almost impossible. And there's been expert evidence given to UK courts about that. You know, the very high conviction rates, uh, the fact that a jury pool will be made up of members of families of people who work in the security state, you know, the Department of State and the, the FBI, CIA and elsewhere. Um, you know, it would be exceptionally difficult. And so, you know, there, there are any number of reasons why, you know, this is not a fair trial not just the Espionage Act, but the trial process itself and a likely outcome. No question. I sat in the trial of CIA whistleblower Jeffrey Sterling, and there was no case made and none needed, and he was convicted. Uh, it, it was a, a mockery of justice. Um, what is the state, do we know, of Julian Assange and his health and his mental health? It's been years since the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture referred to it as torture, the treatment he was receiving. Uh, how is he? Well, he's remarkably resilient. I mean, many of us who, if we were in Belmarsh Prison, which uh, for your listeners and viewers is a, a terrible, terrible place. I mean, it's a really harsh prison environment just outside of London. Uh, you know, the sort of people who go there are people convicted of terrorism offences, um, you know, it's it's really, really hostile environment and it's inhumane um, by any stretch of the imagination and on any definition. So, you know, his physical and mental health continues to decline. And this has been a major issue. And his wife, Stella, has made this point on a number of occasions. Uh, so, you know, leaving aside the politics of this case, the sheer humanity of the case would tell you that enough's enough. More than enough, right? I mean, we ought to have thanked him uh, rather than punished him yeah. for a single minute. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Even, you know, my, my view is, and, and would share it with you, which is that he should not, not be in this position. He should have been able to get on with his life and continuing to do the good work that WikiLeaks and, and Julian were doing in terms of publishing material and shining a light on government practices where we need to do so. I think one of the ironies that might be of interest to your listeners and viewers is in Australia, uh, we now have a special unit that's been established by the Commonwealth Government, the federal government, to look at allegations of war crimes committed by Australian soldiers in Afghanistan. Now, that unit was set up after journalists in Australia won awards for their work in uncovering these allegations of war crimes. And in fact, uh, one of the uh, most senior members of the military, a guy called Ben Robert Smith, who sued uh, some of these journalists lost a defamation case with a judge being very harsh in terms of what he said Robert Smith had done in Afghanistan. And so we laud these journalists and, and we laud the fact that we've had this open process, which has enabled Australians to see what the military is alleged to have got up to in Afghanistan. At the same time, you know, we've got the United States seeking to cover up um, what it did uh, in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, uh, people, no one could forget, if you look at it, the collateral murder video where you see US troops gunned down uh, in the most cold-blooded way, uh, people who are obviously civilians on a Baghdad street. And yet Julian Assange is accused of either harming people or risking harming people when exposing the horrors of war seems to me the exact opposite 
of harming people. This is saving yeah, I mean, people. I mean, and, and this idea, this idea that you know that he put lives at risk, that's been put to bed now twice in two lots of court proceedings. There's no evidence of it. Uh, the Australian government, uh, the Australian Department of Defence, I think, came to the same conclusion. But as you rightly say, uh, anyone who exposes war crimes uh, or ex exposes uh, wrong, wrong, serious wrongdoing in a in a theatre of war deserves congratulations because the only way you get a more peaceful world is by exposing the horrors of war. And if we had more journalists doing their job in the United States, they might have told us that the Democratic Party was cheating one of its candidates out of a primary, out of a nomination in their primary process. We wouldn't have had to get that story uh, through other means. But Whoever got us that information is informing us of the workings of our government. They they ought to be they ought to be thanked, right? Well, we we live in an era, particularly post 9-11, certainly in Australia, and I'm sure it's the same in the United States, where secrecy has become a hallmark of government. I mean, it was always a hallmark of government, but it has been exacerbated by post 9-11 environments and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, where we've seen governments pass legislation to criminalise journalistic activity uh, or to use existing laws, as in the case of Julian Assange, uh, to try and close down much needed scrutiny of government. You know, it, it was never more apparent that governments needed scrutiny uh, than in the post 9-11 environment, where the temptation was to simply say, we're going to throw a, a pall of secrecy over everything. Uh, and if you dare to talk about it publicly and let the public know what's being done in their name, we're going to prosecute you and send you to jail. And this seems like a further step. If Julian Assange is extradited and convicted, what will that do to freedom of the press and good governance around the world? Well, as I've said to you, certainly in Australia, an increasing number of journalists are saying now, and particularly very senior journalists, that this is a really dangerous prosecution because they could find themselves on the end of an extradition request from uh, the US uh, filed in an Australian court. Let's assume for a moment uh, Australian journalists uncover war crimes committed by the United States uh, somewhere in the world or other uh, serious wrongdoing, perhaps in the, uh, in the China containment strategy in the Asia Pacific region. Um, they could find themselves, if they publish secret material, they could find themselves on the end of an extradition request with the US saying, oh, well, we did it to Assange, we can do it to you. We can use the Espionage Act uh, in order to chase you down and bring you to the United States. That's the risk. It's not It's not that so much that it's, a, well, you know, the fact that it's a one-off case is very serious, but it's the precedent value that it sets because, you know, as a lawyer, I know that if prosecutors are successful in using the law in novel ways, um, they tend to keep going with it because it's, they know that it's going to be accepted by a court. And it seems like an example uh, set, a precedent set for every other country on earth as well. I, I mean, I've had yeah. significant Russian government officials tell me, uh, you and your country invaded Iraq, we can invade Ukraine. It's perfectly fine. You overthrow governments, we're going to overthrow that government. You know, when the United States. Yeah, I, I mean, look, it, it, we've seen in the past few weeks, I'm not sure if you picked it up, but I think China now using the Assange case to accuse the US and its allies of hypocrisy when it comes to going after journalists. Um, I think it's been in the context of China uh, seeking to identify some dissidents and, and I think some journalists who were previously in Hong Kong who fled. Uh, and the Chinese making the point, well, the US is doing the same, so why, why are you picking on us? And, you know, every time the uh, United States or, you know, the, the, the democratic world uh, uh, vacates the high ground, the moral and legal high ground, it does allow for this comparison to be made, and you can't blame countries for making it. Well, I'm going to blame them anyway, but I'm going to blame the United States even more. <laughs> what, what, can, what can people do? Do who want to be of help, who want to follow and, and be aware of this uh, delegation's activities coming from Australia to the United States and otherwise want to support dropping the prosecution? Well, th there are a few things people can do. Firstly, th there'll be plenty of media coverage of the Australian delegation. So jump online and uh, retweet it or re-exit, as we say these days. 
uh, and but also you know put it on your social media outlets. Um, the importance of contacting your local MP um, is critical. One of the successes we've had in Australia with our campaign is a lot of Australians ringing and emailing their local politician to say, hey, I'm really concerned about this issue. And, you know, certainly that's really important in the United States, you know, talking to your local congresswoman and congress congressman, um, talking to, you know, senators, uh, making sure they understand that this is a major issue in their constituency uh, or district, as I think you call them, in uh, the United States. Indeed. Uh, people can also go to one of the places I work, rootsaction.org, and sign a petition to Attorney General Merrick Garland to drop the prosecution. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, the sorry, just interrupting you there, that, you know, petitions also are really useful. We've got one running in Australia that's got hundreds of thousands of signatures on it now, and uh, that's useful. There's also a letter, I think, circulating um, amongst a few Congress people uh, earlier in the year, which we're encouraging other congressmen and women to sign. Uh, and um, uh, that, uh, I think, was started by some of the Democrats. Uh, so, um, you know, again, getting more congressmen and women to sign that document as Australian MPs have signed this current letter is really important. This has been going on so long that you can get Democrats to sign it when there's a Republican in the White House and Republicans when there's a Democrat in the White House. Are, are Republicans becoming any more supportive, do you know, since Joe Biden took the throne? Well, I mean, I think the, the point is that uh, the point is that, um, you know, uh, this is not a party political issue and we are seeing Republicans who are supporting Sanj. I think in terms of the current suite of potential presidential candidates, at least one or two have made the point that they would pardon Assange uh, or ensure that the prosecution, uh, the extradition request was dropped. Uh, and so uh, that's also happening in Australia where we're urging the Albanese government and particularly the prime minister who's visiting President Biden next month to go to uh, Washington and say, this is a bedrock alliance issue and you need to resolve it. I certainly hope that he does and that he's listened to. Uh, I know a lot of groups and individuals are preparing to make a huge noise and rally and protest if there's an extradition. Uh, seems kind of too late, uh, although we, we certainly need to do that. Uh, well, I mean, you got you got to keep pushing. And, you know, as I say, the ideal opportunity is in is in October, uh, is, in, is in October when you've got you know, the Prime Minister of Australia going to the White House for a couple of days uh, and uh, an ideal opportunity to say, this is the time for a joint statement to say, we are ending the Assange matter. The other the other point that I think gets forgotten, and I don't know whether you agree with me that it ought, people ought to be constantly reminded is that the, the CIA came up with plans to kill him. Uh, this yeah. was- this well, we, we, that's right. That's right. I mean, we know that, that when Mike Pompeo was running the CIA, uh, that, that's exactly right. I think it was, uh, uh, I think Yahoo News, it might have been, or one of, one of the um, news services, uh, online news services, I think, revealed this. Um, and, you know, you've also had the spying, the unlawful spying on Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in meetings with his lawyers and, and at other times. It's been appalling. The egregious breaches of procedural fairness and of justice in this case demand on, on their own, that this case is ended. We, we've got just five minutes left. What, what do you think this is doing to this plus the, <laughs> the crazy drive toward hostility with China uh, is doing to relations between the US and Australia? If, if, if the Australian government is ignored, if these Assange is extradited and convicted and incarcerated or worse, what, what does that do to this relationship? Well, we would say it puts the relationship at risk because you've got a huge number of Australians who are saying to the United States, back off. Um, and you've got a prime minister who's been very firm about it, as is the foreign minister, Penny Wong. And so this is an alliance issue. And if Australia is to be treated seriously in the alliance and as an equal partner, which the US says that it is, then the US must accede to this request to end uh, this case against Julian Assange and allow this Australian citizen to be reunited with his family. 
sounds like a silver lining almost. I hesitate to say it. A lot of us would like this alliance shattered, would like nuclear submarines not to go to Australia. We think it looks like a build up toward a yeah. wall. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the interesting things is some of the, the greatest supporters of Assange have been, for example, former Foreign Minister Bob Carr, who's made the point that he's totally opposed to AUKUS, you know, and the, and the submarine deal, particularly the submarine deal, uh, and the build-up in, in the Asia-Pacific region. But on the other hand, he's also making the point, well, we've got it. The US says that Australia is a bedrock partner in the alliance, then let's test that um, and make sure that uh, Julian Assange is allowed to return to his family. He certainly should be. Uh, Greg Barnes, what uh, can people do to stay in touch with you and follow what you're doing? Do you have a, a website? Yeah, or well, the Australian, if they Google Australian Assange campaign, they'll see our website, they'll see our socials, you know, Facebook page, etc. Uh, so, uh, you know, please go online. Uh, uh, there's a parliamentary committee in Australia headed by Andrew Wilkie, W-I-L-K-I-E, uh, and a guy called Julian Hill. Um, uh, and they ought to be um, going to their websites as well and seeing the work that they're doing on Assange and, and encouraging Australian politicians to keep the fight up. We have been speaking with Greg Barnes, senior counsel, an Australian barrister and a member of the Australian uh, Assange Committee, a uh, former president of the Australian Lawyers Alliance. Uh, Greg Barnes, thank you for what you're doing, for your time and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you very much, David. Thanks for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way. This is Tim with the Peace Almanac from worldbeyondwar.org. September 21st. This is the International Day of Peace. Also on this day in 1943, the U.S. Senate passed by a vote of 73 to 1 the Fulbright Resolution, expressing commitment to a post-war international organization. The resulting United Nations, along with other international institutions created at the end of World War II, has of course had a very mixed record in terms of advancing peace. Also on this day in 1963, the War Resisters League organized the first U.S. demonstration against the war in Vietnam. The movement that grew from there eventually played a major role in ending that war and turning the U.S. public against war to such an extent that warmongers in Washington began to refer to public resistance to war as a disease, the Vietnam Syndrome. Also on this day in 1976, Orlando Letelier, a leading opponent of Chilean dictator General Augusto Pinochet, was killed on Pinochet's order, along with his American assistant, Ronnie Moffitt, by a car bomb in Washington, D.C., the work of a former CIA operative. The International Day of Peace was first celebrated in 1982 and is recognized by many nations and organizations with events all over the world every September 21st, including day-long pauses in wars that reveal how easy it would be to have year-long or forever-long pauses in wars. On this day, the United Nations Peace Bell is rung at UN headquarters in New York City. This is a good day on which to work for permanent peace and to remember the victims of war. The Peace Almanac can be found online at worldbeyondwar.org.